Wonderswan has an IPS display. Bloop, 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 bloop. I'm sure we all remember being a Japanese salaryman in the late 90s. The real estate bubble burst, collapsing the country into a deep recession. Half of all full-time workers were reduced to part-time employment. The death rate began to exceed the birth rate. And the only affordable way to kill time was playing all your favorite interactive stories on this 10-button JRPG juggernaut. But just in case you weren't there, here's a quick rundown. The man behind the creation of the Game Boy, Gunpei Yokoi, had just parted ways with his longtime employer Nintendo on account of him also being the creator of the Virtual Boy, the ultimate shame of 1990s Japan. Thus, the Wonder Swan was born. It sold a couple of million units, got a release with a color screen, and had a bunch of games made for it, mostly by Bandai. And then it was discontinued before we could see a release in the West. That's about as much of a history lesson as you're going to get here today, so let's take a look at the kit. The kit comes with a display, a printed circuit board, insulating film, a glass lens, two-sided tape, two-sided tape, ribbon cable, wire, and wire and this neat plastic container, which I use to store candy. Now it's safe from bears. Let's get started. You'll need a soldering iron. Chisel tip works best on this one. The ideal temperature will be around 275 to 300 degrees Celsius. You'll need a hankering for games none of your friends will ever care about. You'll need some conductive pads. Optionally, you may want a screwdriver set and a spudger and flush cutters, not to be confused with flesh cutters. That's from my other channel, Tanner Does Body Mods. Hey, quiet in there, I'm talking about Wonder Swans. Now to open this up, I'm going to take a Torx T6 from my handy dandy screwdriver set. You could use the included screwdriver, but frankly that looks too much like an Allen key and makes me think I'm building Ikea furniture, which reminds me way too much of my failed relationships. Once all the screws are off, remove the back of the shell. You may notice the shell doesn't want to come apart at the bottom. Ignore its separation anxiety and pull from the top. There you go. It's all open. There are no more screws to be taken out. Put the back plate off to the side. Don't forget to put your battery lock slider in a safe space as well. Next. Unhook the screen ribbon cable. You can probably do this with your fingers, but a spudger tool comes in handy. And it saves your fingers the embarrassment of not being able to get it on the first try. With the motherboard no longer attached to the screen, we can put it off to the side and focus solely on the front housing. You may want to put the buttons here off to the side. However, I'm not going to. I believe in myself. To get the screen unattached from the plastic front plate, rock the plate back and forth like a tiny ice cube tray. While you do this, you can pretend you're a giant that's making margaritas for his friends. The screen should start to pop off of the case. Now would be a good time to use your spudger like a dollhouse crowbar and pry up the rest of the screen. Remember when I said I wouldn't take the buttons out? I lied. Pop the lens from the inside and hang it on your wall as a picture frame. Place the next screen adhesive down and prepare to place the screen. With the black ribbon facing towards the eight X and Y buttons, push the screen towards the bottom left corner and press it down into place. Next, remove all the adhesive from the screen lens and place it down. If you're lucky, no dust will have found its way into your screen assembly and you won't have to think about it again. Unfortunately, a little bit of dust got into ours. I'm not happy with that. I'm going to have to open this up later and correct my mistakes. Place your insulating film down and try not to get lost in the eyes of that stranger looking back at you from the mirrored back of the screen. That's just the ghost of gunpay. Attach the PCB to the screen and bring the motherboard back. Let's work that motherboard. First things first, we don't want this padding anymore. Remove it. Flush cutters work well. But if you're a real renegade, they'll use a taped up 10 year old razor blade you found at a Home Depot. Not even for sale, it was just kind of there. This would be a good time to clean your contacts and place your conductive pads down where necessary. Using the squares where the padding used to be as your guide, place down your second insulating film. Hopefully you've preheated your soldering iron to 275 because it's time to solder. Take the two wires that came with your kit and solder them down to each of the battery terminals. I usually go for the upper part of the terminal to solder to with the wires facing downwards. 
Feed the negative wire up through the hole at the top of the battery terminal. The positive end doesn't have a convenient hole like the rest of us, so just go under the board. Run the wires to the board on the screen, trim them, strip them, and solder them down. Attach the ribbon cable to the screen board. Don't do what Tanner does. Make sure the ribbon cable is blue side up on the screen board and blue side down on the motherboard. When you're feeling very sure of yourself, put lots of creases in the ribbon cable. This will ensure you have a bad time later when you need to put creases in the exact same spot but in a different direction. Put the whole thing back together to test it and realize you are a dumbass. When you refuse to believe that you did anything wrong, put a thick layer of captain tape over the entire screen board. The effort is futile, but it'll help you feel better. Now that we have sound and no picture, we can finally admit to ourselves that we've made a mistake. Put the ribbon cable in again, but this time do it right, stupid. Put the shell back together and test again. It doesn't work, but we get a picture this time, which means that we've done the ribbon cable properly. Now the problem isn't our fault. Hopefully. Maybe. Good enough. Spend at least three more hours trying to figure out why things aren't working properly and you can't seem to get past the intro screen. Then, give up. Whatever, I'm done. You aren't smart enough to figure this out. The next day, decide to try again. Start by grabbing a new Wonder Swan from the pile of Wonder Swans you keep under your bed. Okay, so this one works. The screen is just dead. Perfect. Swap the motherboard with another motherboard, just like your father did with your mother when you were eight. If this fixes the problem, congratulations! You have no clue what went wrong, and no clue how to fix it. You just got a brand new Wonder Swan and put it in there. You did nothing. Do not feel proud of yourself for this. We still don't know what the problem is. Put the whole thing back together again, and hit the subscribe button. I think one of these three capacitors did a gun pay and died on me. Congratulations! Come back next time when we change the capacitors on the faulty motherboard. Tanner does mods, Tanner does mods, this is the ending theme of Tanner does mods. Please leave a comment and subscribe and share with your friends and come back again next time.